Welcome to Relentless Truth with John Warren, the podcast that extracts truth from a wide range of topics, revealing who God is, who we are, and how we relate to each other. Now, here's John with this week's powerful and practical insights. Welcome to Relentless Truth. I'm John Warren. It is good to be with you. Please like, share, review, feel free to comment on our podcast. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts at Apple, Google, Spotify, or you can go to our website, johnwarrenmedia.com. You can also contact us there or by sending an email to john at johnwarrenmedia.com. Today, I'm going to try to take on a challenging topic, and I do so Somewhat hypocritically, today is all about children. I've titled it uh, Children's Lives Matter, just to pick a clever way to title it. But I'm burdened by something, and I'm going to explain what that is. It's a burden that I have sensed for a number of years. So I've got to qualify all of this. I hope you'll stay with me through a a little bit of uh, qualification here. First, I, with our last bank, we had a presence over in Tampa and I was president of that bank. So I had to drive over many, many early mornings to Tampa from the Orlando area. And I would listen to a, on a well-known Christian radio network, I would listen to a well-known Christian broadcast that would uh, talk about the uh, family from time to time. And they would have experts on occasionally to talk about parenting. And I remember kind of rolling my eyes and thinking, wow, these people are so incredibly naive. Parenting just doesn't work that way. It's so much more complex. And so I want to go into this topic acknowledging that, yes, it's complex. And I have a number of friends and and parents of my students who I consider friends. And I'm concerned that you're going to think I'm talking to you. And I'm not. I am talking just in in very general terms about a burden I feel for this generation of young people that are coming up now. And I'm not sure what they call themselves. I know about Gen Z and all of that. I'm not sure where that stops and starts, but I'm talking about high school, college students and young adults right now, maybe going all the way back to middle school for now. And then the, the second thing that comes to mind is I remember you know, I just read something not long ago, and I, I think I had read this before about Dr. Phil, uh, you know, the guy that Oprah made uh, famous. And he, yeah, people have questioned his credentials. Uh, it, it's all it kind, kind of interesting, really. I, I think he means well, and I, I think he has obviously become a celebrity, has his own show now. And sometimes I don't listen to it, I don't watch a show, but I, but I have caught bits and pieces or friends have sent me excerpts of his advice. And, you know, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not so good. So, and I, I know there, you know, James Dobson and others have, have, have made their living or at least it made it their vocation to, to dispense parenting advice. And that's really not what I'm doing today. I, I hope what I'm doing is dispensing perspective maybe. And I hope this will be helpful. So I'm going to I'm going to dive right in and I'm going to rifle through and I hope I don't sound like I'm whining, but I'm going to, I'm going to rifle through about 10 or so, maybe a few more topics, subtopics on, on this, this issue of our children, of our young people. They don't like being called children once they reach middle school and older. The, and in a sense, if you're a young person and you're listening and say, well, I'm not a parent, I hope you'll stay with me as well, because I want you to hear maybe some perspective on you know, maybe what it's like to parent you. And and perhaps this will benefit both you and parents. And again, I'm going to say some things that are going to sound so naive, and I realize they're incomplete and imperfect, and I'm going to leave it at that and stop qualifying this. So the first issue I want to talk about is the national debt. Now, you know, you're probably rolling your eyes thinking, wow, he always talks about the national debt. It does concern me. And it concerns me that 
we're so irresponsible that we really, I almost titled this session, We Hate Our Kids. And the, the reason, this episode rather, and, and the reason for that is we, we spend their money like we're just absolutely crazed. And, and we've racked up almost $30 trillion. In fact, we've committed to more than $30 trillion in debt. And I would just challenge you, go to Google, look it up, pull up the graph, and look and, look and see how much debt we've taken on in the last 5, 10 years. It's crazy. And I worry about when interest rates start to rise, are we, are we actually going to be able to pay the interest on the debt? And where you get into real trouble is when you reach insolvency, where you're taking on more debt to pay your debt, pay the interest on your debt. Yeah, a family can't do that. You end up in bankruptcy court. And so it troubles me that we don't think about our kids. And I, I remember having a conversation with a judge who's a friend of mine. And back then, uh, he, he doesn't do this anymore. He's, he's, he's over another court now. But he had the uh, juvenile court in Orlando and he, it was, it was really interesting that somebody raised their hand and said he, he had complained about the fact that it took six months. That was, there was a backlog that he was so under-resourced that if you committed a crime and were arrested as a, a juvie, as he called it, uh, you waited six months to go to court. And he said, just imagine if while you're parenting, you got home from work and, and your child was in trouble at school and you said, I'm going to talk to you about this in six months. And he said, the absurdity of that. Uh, shouldn't be lost on us. And somebody in my group raised their hand and said, why does it work that way? Why, why do we tolerate that? Why don't we spend the resources? And he, he quickly quipped. He said, well, kids don't vote. And I think that sort of is why debt as a nation is so appealing. We can just go, we can solve problems. We can invent new problems. We can, we can create problems that aren't really problems that will advantage us politically and spend unbelievable amounts of money and with little regard for reason and meaning little regard for how we're going to pay it back. And I, I think it has something to do with the fact that it's, it's kicking the can down the road. It's, you know, human nature being what it is, but it's also, it also has something to do with the fact that, well, we have to worry about that. Somebody else will take care of it. And, and I, I believe we don't think that through. Sometimes we, our politicians become, you know, as I've said in previous episodes, they become so full of themselves and so just obsessed with the idea of, of having a career in politics and getting reelected that they don't even give it thought. But I think the first way that we communicate the fact that children don't matter in this country is through debt and our accumulation of national debt. The other thing that that I see is and and this is when we're done with this episode you're going to you shake your head some of you and and you'll you'll say wow he contradicts himself or he takes both sides of an issue or he speaks you uh, know in, in a way that is contradictory and yes I do and I have to because this is a nuanced topic and so I'm first going to say our our children our young people want to be led and parented they need to be parented and we sometimes check out too early. And I know I'm also, in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about treating them like adults instead of like children. So I, I, I realize the, the contradiction there. But engagement by parents is important. Engage, we have to, we must engage in the lives of our young people. And this period that we're talking about and these are distinct age groups. These are distinct developmental stages, and I realize that. And they're not homogenous. That is, middle school is one thing. High school, early high school is another. Late high school, 11th and 12th grade for most students, is quite another. College is another. Undergrad is one thing. Graduate school is another. And then young adulthood is yet another. I'm talking about the entire period because I see it from time to time where Parents believe that they're beginning to annoy their kids, their children, their students, and they, with the best of intentions, we check out and we say, well, there you go. We raised them well. They're a young adult. In some cultures at age 13, 14, 15, they go to work 
So there you go. Have at it. I've had students who, whose parents told them that and family culture and family rules are, are kind of interesting and, and diverse, and I respect that. But they've told their students that when you turn 18, I expect you, and you're out of high school, I expect you to live on your own. And developmentally, that'll be good for you. But I believe that our students need, they think about this, they lack confidence. The most confident student that I've ever had in class still has the need for security, for a sense of balance, for a sense of being loved and nurtured. And that need, I think, goes into young adulthood. Now, we we change the way we do that. We don't, you know, pick them up from school any longer. They get in their own car and drive to school. Or we don't police all of their activity. We don't supervise them closely. But they still need to be parented. Now, what that looks like varies from family to family. Sometimes it's just communication. It's just letting, letting them know daily that you care. We try to do that with our daughter who's 23 years old and she's a PhD student. And we, we work hard to, and it's not work, it's a pleasure, but to send a text every morning, to talk to her several times a week, to text throughout the day when she's available and wants to. And it requires some intuitive thinking, requires some nuance, requires uh, good listening skills, knowing, knowing when they need us and when they don't. But point two is we don't parent. We stop parenting. And at the stage where they need us most and balancing the, the, the need for them to learn how to make decisions and, and our micromanaging or overmanaging them, bal- balancing that is, is, a, is a real challenge. They need some freedom. They need to begin to make their own decisions, but we need to uh, provide them with love and nurturing and compassion and help along the way. They will tell us if we ask them, young people this age, particularly I get to spend a lot of time with some amazing, and and by the way, their families are amazing as well, but some amazing 11th and 12th graders. And I get to see them beginning to to get ready to kind of stand on the edge of the nest and and jump and learn to fly on their own. And it, it is precious. It is beautiful to see. I would just encourage parents, though, encourage all of us as parents to continue to parent. They still need us. You know, we can't make their environment foolproof the way that we do with, try to do with babies, with infants and toddlers, where we, we plug all the outlets, make all the doors safe, don't give them access to cabinets and that kind of thing. There's no, there's no real equivalent to that at this age, but they do need us to be there for them and to, to help them along the way. And I think I can make that point a little differently in a few minutes as we uh, move through this list. So third, we tend to, in some cases, it's tempting to treat them like children for too long, to not allow any risk-taking, to give them too many soft landings. And I'm, I'm not talking about participation trophies it, it, and all of that. I'm not talking about the making them snowflakes. I, I mean, I, I, guess, I guess those concepts came out of this concern, but and our drivers behind this concern, but I'm talking about something more serious. I don't like those caricatures. I really believe this generation and the one before it get misrepresented in that, that regard. I'm just talking about not allowing them to make some decisions and to begin to, as they enter adulthood and what I, to make their own decisions and begin to take on some, some responsibility and what tends to happen in my experience is just as an observer is is that we we go from we go from treating them like children to turning a switch and say there you go on your own and and that happens at different stages that happens sometimes when they go off to college sometimes it happens if they live at home during college it happens when they go to grad school or get a job but they often aren't ready for that because we've treated them like children those of you who are parents, especially of multiple siblings, you know that 
that there's an artful way to begin to let them make their own decisions, be there for them, love them through it. Now, my wife would tell you that I tend to still to this day to overparent, to worry too much, to want to interfere too much. And so I have to make myself pull back and let our daughter make her own decisions. She's very capable. If you know her, you know that she makes really good decisions and I'm very proud of her. It's not, it's not her. It's me as the cliche goes, but I, I, I struggle with this. But I think it's important that, to give them responsibilities, let them take on their responsibilities, but don't forget the second topic that we just discussed. We can't forget to parent. That parenting just looks like something else. It looks a little different as we move into this age group, particularly, particularly late high school and, and college. So our parenting, our care from them, evolves from covering electrical outlets to relying on our experience, relying on the truths of scripture that we know, and relying on life lessons and and giving them just a, a little bit of a safety net. Kind of, I think of it as staying in the the fat part of the bell curve. Avoid the tails of the bell curve, if you think in terms of linear regression. Kind of Avoid the pitfalls that are very, very dangerous. And on the other side of the bell curve, avoid the, I don't take any risk whatsoever and stay in the middle and experience life, learn your own life lessons with a, with a little bit of a safety net and parents around who love you and care for the, the uh, student or young person generously, graciously, abundantly. So, there's another thing that goes on, and I, 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 I've got to be careful with this because I'm rifling through this list. I told myself I wasn't going to qualify every word I said here, but it's tempting to. We diagnose them. We characterize them. We caricature them to death. We name all kinds of disorders. We'll take personality tendencies and label our children. Now, there are some issues that are diagnosable that are real. There, there are genetic disorders, there are illnesses, there are psychological issues. I, I am not diminishing those things. I'm saying we have a tendency to label people and we do it with our children. Personality testing. I cringe when I hear, and I, I, I don't even remember Myers-Briggs and all the all the uh, categories, but I, I think it's like INTJ or ENTJ or something like that. I think the first one is introversion or extroversion. But but we, we can, through various instruments that are well-intended, label our children a certain way. And instead of helping them strengthen their weaknesses, we reinforce those weaknesses by labeling them as such. Now, I had a student... And I, I'm going to I'm going to say his first name and he'll know who he is. His name is Eric. And I, I love his family, have had his siblings in classes and know his parents. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, he he experiences he has a reading issue. And I, I don't know whether it's technically been diagnosed as dyslexia or not, but it's that's what it manifests as. And I remember he was in my classes and we got through. I guess the first half of the year, the school year, and he would raise his hand to read in class. And, and I could tell he struggled a little bit, but not, not a lot. And, and he's really good natured and incredibly smart and incredibly talented. And I remember another student told me, I mean, I think maybe even shouted it out in class because he's very public about this, or I wouldn't mention it on this podcast. He said, you realize he, he has dyslexia or has a reading issue or whatever. And I said, well, I, I, I really wasn't sure of that. And Eric interrupted and he said, he said, oh no, Mr. Warren, I got this. He said, uh, I need the practice. And I thought, wow, if we just parented that way. And I, I know there are some challenges that require patience and love and care and sensitivity. And, and in the classroom, believe me, if I have a student who has the severe anxiety or a reading issue, I don't just randomly call on students to read. I let them volunteer. I'll sometimes, if it's just shyness, I'll sometimes gently 
engage a student, but I'm very careful. I don't want students to leave my classroom uh, defeated or embarrassed, or I, I don't want to create strife. I don't want bullies. Uh, we don't have many, but but bullies to uh, people who tend to to do that to embarrass other students. I don't want to give them cause to to do so. But Eric's that kind of guy, and he reads along and corrects himself and works hard at it. You can just tell that that he. He knows that's an issue and he's overcoming it. And I, I can't guarantee another student's success, a particular student's success, but I'd place a wager on his. He is, uh, his parents parent him well. Some would call it free range parenting. Uh, my wife and I often say that we did that with our daughter late in high school and it's uncomfortable. And I know there's tension. It requires much prayer, much thought, much sort of a delicate balancing to pull this off, but letting them fail, letting them stretch and not labeling or diagnosing them to death is kind of the way I would say it. That's, that's an important consideration, I think. So uh, number five is similar, I guess, but sometimes we have low expectations. I see, I see both ends of a spectrum, either incredibly low expectations for our, our young people or high expectations that aren't realistic. And I think sometimes we're afraid of, I guess I could call it tiger parenting. We're, we're afraid of being that parent that pushes too hard and insists on too much. And we can just turn it off and have very low expectations. This requires also nuanced, artful delivery. But to have expectations, to communicate standards, to have to have realistic understanding in these matters, I think we've got to know, we've got to do a couple of things. We've got to know who man is and who God is in Scripture. We've talked about that before, and we've got to know that we're all depraved sinners, that the earth has fallen. We've got to know about the tendency of humans to be lazy, to to do bad things. And we've also got to know that we're made in God's image and we're capable of amazing things. And, and there, there's balance there. So, so I think sometimes we obsess over having expectations that are too high and we just turn expectations off altogether. And to do this, we have to know our children. Now, I'm an advocate, and you've heard from my wife before on this topic, we are advocates of, of homeschooling or some derivative of that. And not everybody can do that, and it's entirely possible to do what I'm about to say, whether you're in public school, private school, homeschool, charter school, some other schooling methodology, virtual schooling, or, or whatever. And that is this. It is so important, and I, I know you're thinking, well, he doesn't understand. I'm overwhelmed, and I've got multiple kids, and I've got pressure. I've got a hard job. I've got demands on me professionally or vocationally, or my time demands are such that I've got family issues, I've got extended family with health. I, I know all the, the concerns. This fallen earth has presented us, presents us with challenges. But I'm just going to say this. If we spend time in our own imperfect way, knowing our children, that means that means spending time with them, not annoying them, not monopolizing them, not dominating every second of every day with them, but really getting to know them sometimes as they get older on their terms, not, not doing our hobbies with us, but doing theirs with them, pursuing their interests with them. And they're going to they're gonna give you the signal that I want to hang out with my friends all the time and I don't want to hang out with you. And somehow we've got to work through that so that, yeah, there's some, there's some hanging out with friends time, but there's also some, some being with us time because we want to know you and who you are. We love you, know you, and want to nurture you because of who you are in Christ, because you are an image bearer of God, and we are impressed with that in you. I think that is incredibly important. I say that as if I do it well and as if I've known it all my life. Neither of those two things are true. So, so expectations are important 
And to have them to get in that center lane that that is just right in this regard, we have to know our young people. And they change. It is amazing to me. I saw a picture the other day, and, and I'm sure you've been through this, many of you, of my daughter. Uh, she sent me her driver's license for, for an insurance thing we were doing, making a change. And I asked her for a picture of her driver's license. And I looked at it and, it, and she looked like a different person. And, and I, I actually said that to her in a text. I said, wow, you've changed so much. And you don't notice these changes physically when they happen over many years. That was six or seven years ago. And, and you, you just don't notice it. And the same thing is happening with them developmentally. They're, they're morphing, they're changing, they're developing, they're dealing with challenges, they're, they're becoming more mature, they're, they're dealing with a different kind of problem, they're, they're engaging in the world, they're thinking about the future, they're stressed out, their stress changes from how do I make A's in all my classes or A's and B's or whatever it is their target is to, to what am I going to do vocationally? Who am I going to marry? How am I going to live? And, and sometimes marriage isn't even an issue. It's, it's, it, it's how am I going to live? How am I going to make a living? Am I going to live on my own? Where am I going to live? What am I going to do? My interests are this. Can I get paid for doing that? I get all these inputs that are confusing. And we've got to know them through all of these phases. So I do this imperfectly. My wife does it much more closely to perfect, but but it, it's important to make the effort to know them through this entire process, even when they give us signals that they really don't want to be close to us in this regard and with this subject on this day or, and there, there's balance required there. So let's move on to the next one. I think this is number six. They are starved, our young people, are starved for challenges. And so are we. They need to be challenged. And they will revert to behavior that isn't very challenging, environments that aren't very challenging. And yet, deep inside, I believe they, and we all, are starved to be challenged. And that can be physically challenged in a sport, in an activity. It is often mentally challenged. Sometimes it's emotionally stretched and challenged. Sometimes it's biblically challenged. It's principally challenged. It's morally challenged. If, if we create an environment that just, where we, where we just have no accountability and, and we all just accept each other just the way we are, any behavior is just fine and we don't have to stretch and we don't have to be challenged, my goodness, life becomes incredibly boring. Now, where it's really fun is when you see your child, when you see your young person in their, in their early 20s and they're reaching out and challenging themselves. When they know that this is a fulfilling life to live this way and they go find challenges that are completely appropriate. We need to reinforce that. We need to create an environment. We need to help them. We don't create the entire environment. I understand that. But in the environment we find ourselves, we need to give them opportunities to reinforce opportunities that challenge them. Not so that they can pass the time more quickly or more efficiently or with a sense of peace about the passage of time, but because personal growth is cool. Personal growth is needed. On all these fronts, if you want a fulfilled young person who's not depressed and anxious, and th those are things we all face, but not bored out of their minds, create an environment that gives them some challenges. And they will, they will embrace that. They'll see how fulfilled that makes them. And if some of those challenges can be spiritually related, if some of those challenges are biblically based where they're studying scripture, reading scripture, praying, that is all the, all the more appropriate. All right, next. So they're starved for challenges. Next is they're 
is a tendency. This is, this is a really negative item here, but I'm going to say it. There's a tendency on the part of this generation, and they'll tell you this if you ask, to spend too much time in online activities. Whether it's gaming, gaming's kind of the low-hanging fruit here, the, the easy one to criticize. Whether it's binge-watching series on Netflix or some other, one of the 400 other alternatives, or something, there's just too much unmanaged, unfocused time online. And, you know, you've heard about the dopamine hit you get from doing all of that, and it's an addiction. It's addictive. And parents, we, we can't, you know, we, we don't have license to, we haven't built the equity with our young people to opine on this or to give them a, the, a nudge in the right direction or to steer them or hold them accountable in this regard if we're doing it ourselves. So just a one negative that I, I want to talk about you know, just briefly is, is this notion of unmanaged online time. Not to mention the fact that I know about a couple of really tragic, sad situations where young people become addicted to pornography or, or, or whatever else, or get themselves into gambling or investing or in, in things they, they have no business doing at their age. Instead, pick some fun activities, invest in some stocks together, or, or even learn how to play some games with them and, but engage them and be aware that this dopamine hit from too much unmanaged online time is a, is a challenge. Now, this next one is a word that I, I don't like because it sounds really militaristic to me, but accountability. Accountability in this world is increasingly lacking. Now, I sound like an old fart when I say that, and I understand that, but I personally don't like a lot of accountability in my life. I, I can't stand it when somebody in evangelical circles says, well, we're going to have accountability partners. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, somebody's going to get all up in my business who isn't going to understand me and probably doesn't have their own act together and they're going to think they're Lord over me and they're going to hold me accountable. Well, we, we mess it up a, a, a lot of the time in the church. So, so, so that caricature that I just painted, recognize it comes from that, those failed efforts. But real accountability, some sense of responsibility, uh, a, a real not a punitive environment, not one that is controlling and domineering, but there has to be accountability in this life. If we dumb it down to where any old performance is fine, then we being flawed humans will, will embrace that. We won't live reward, rewarded lives. We won't live rewarding, fulfilled lives, but it's important through this age period, this during this this period, this especially late high school through college through young adulthood, to have some expectations. Now, you might be thinking, wow, when they're in their early 20s and they're off on their own and they live on their own, if they do, how do I do that? Well, one of the things that you can do, and this isn't a real practical discussion and it's certainly not comprehensive, but one of the things you can do is, is, is we, we call it with our daughter, she's, she's slowly coming off the payroll. So with items like insurance and cell phones and all the rest, you know, you, you, you cut the cord on some of those things, and you, but you do it in a way that they can handle at the appropriate time. And every situation is different and requires discernment. But you can still have some accountability. You know, we, we expect you to, to handle this responsibly. And you'll find that they will the typical young person will come to you as you engage in this process. If you've started it early enough and you've done it in a loving, kind way, they'll come to you with advice. They'll ask for some implicit accountability. All right. Next is church. And, and this, this is one of the most important. And, and if I, if, if pastors of, of uh, my students' uh, families are listening to this podcast, please forgive me because I'm I'm going to meddle just a little bit. And and if you're concerned about this, I'm probably it's probably not you that I'm concerned about or talking to. But 
we've allowed church, the, the evangelical church has devolved in, in, in some cases, not all, but in many cases into a, a fun, entertaining, segregation from adults kind of exercise. And I, I'm just going to blurt this out. I see young people, including our daughter, in churches that don't do that, that total segregation where, where young people enter in a different place, worship in a different place, serve in a different place, gather in a different place, and the two don't really meet until all of a sudden you're in your 20s and bam, you go in with the adults and wow, how boring compared to what we're accustomed to. If, you, if we integrate young people if we let me just say this and i know much has been written about this multiple generational engagement is a gift from god our daughter loves to hang out with toddlers in her church she enjoys people her own age she enjoys young parents And she enjoys grandparents and great-grandparents. She's got relationships with all of those people. And I've seen this with many of my students. I've seen families who go to great lengths to plug in their young people across all of those generations I I just identified. All of those age groups. That is so important and so fulfilling. Young people want to hear stories from parents and grandparents and great grandparents, if not theirs from others, there's a way for the church to provide a multi-generational experience. And I know people who, who focus on their seminary degrees on this. And I, I realize I'm, I'm just scratching the surface and I know there's the need for some segregation based on age and even gender sometimes for certain topics, but I would encourage you church leaders to realize the value of multi-generational integration. It's just better. Now, do they get annoyed with us when we tell them too many boring old stories? Do they, do they, when they're talking to people who are very elderly, who are in their eighties and nineties and they hear those great depression stories, do they get tired of it after all? Sure. Can it be annoying to volunteer to take care of the toddlers in Sunday school every week? Yes, annoying and not not entirely appropriate at that age. But some integration is valuable. Babysitting, getting to know young families, getting to know people who are maybe 10 or 15 years older than they are, who've just experienced some of the challenges not, not long ago, who can really remember keenly some of the challenges that they the stu- the subject students the subject young people are beginning to experience now got to be careful about you know who that is and 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 I I would encourage a good cross section of of friendships and relationships but but the church should be about not just expository preaching not just really strong theology and doctrine. But I think if those things are strong, then, then we tend to understand this topic that I'm talking about. And we need, we need to pay attention to young people and provide them with the kind of environment that I'm describing. It's too easy to ignore them, as my friend who is the judge who I mentioned earlier said, because they don't vote. It's too easy just to overlook them and not realize that this investment in them is one of the most important things we can do. All right. I hope this is helpful. I have a few more. Just a couple more. There's a one that just hits so close to home. And I, I want to encourage you today with this. The next topic is, is what we model ourselves. This do as I say, not as I do. It doesn't work for anyone at any level. We say do this. And then what do we do when we get in the car afterwards or, or we, we have some downtime together and we gossip, we slander, we complain, we phone it in, etc. Young people see right through us. 
On the other hand, we don't have to be perfect at this. Effort is the key. Well-focused, smart, timely effort is the key. But I have to say it, what we model personally, who we are personally, who we are in Christ, how we, how we walk out our lives, it's always going to be imperfect, but it will. they pick up on it. They see us so clearly. I know you know this, but I had to say it in this session, in this episode, because we can't preach one thing, say one thing, do another, and have them just accept it. And they're going to reach an age, those of you with younger children, they reach an age where they're going to they're gonna hold you accountable to some degree. You're going to have one of those moments where, well, you don't do that, Dad. Yeah, you say this, but you do that. We've had a few of those. I remember them like they're yesterday where my initial reaction was to kind of bow up a little bit. And then I was reduced to tears on a couple of occasions because she was right. I was inconsistent. I said, do as I say, not as I do. I didn't even realize that, that, that the, the doing didn't match the saying part. So I think what we model is also important. It doesn't have to be perfect. We ought to be authentic, uh, whatever that means. It, it means keep it real. They see right through us. If we try to sugarcoat everything and dress everything up and, and you know, everything isn't a theme park party at Disney. In real life, stinks sometimes real life is tough admitting that we were inconsistent admitting our faults having the kind of relationship where we say you know what sweetie i blew it there and i'm sorry i blew it and i'm gonna i'm gonna trust god that i'll do better going forward and i want you to tell me when i don't there's an artful way to have that conversation you've got to have it your way that conversation your way with your culture and your style your communication style but it's important to not live a do as I say. I've heard parents, and not associated with my students, thankfully, but I've heard parents say, because I'm your dad. Well, if you've got, I get that, but if we've got to just rely on on our, our genetic privilege as father and not a, a, a nurturing, helpful style, then then we can get in real trouble as parents. And I, I just think that's a weak position and we ought to be careful with what we, what we say and do and having the kind of relationship where communication is healthy. So I guess the one I want to close with is, is I'm kind of back to the beginning. We don't stop parenting. We don't. They need us. We need our parents as older adults. There's so much to say there biblically. I'm so impressed with many of you who you're not parenting. That's probably the wrong word, but you're influencing, you're shaping, you're serving by example and by engagement with young generations. It's important to live a life that recognizes that the future of our country, the future of our world, the future of Evangelical Christianity, true Christianity, is in the hands of a young generation every 15 or 20 years. And that is a perpetual challenge for all of us. No matter what we do vocationally, we should invest in this generation, in this next generation, and the next, and the next if God gives us length of life on this earth, we should make it. There, there are a couple of couples, there, there maybe three or four even, who I know who are uh, late 70s through 90, which a few years ago sounded really old and is becoming less old the older I get. But they make it their business to engage with college students. They make it their business to engage with, with young people, with our daughter. And they do it well. And they... They genuinely admire and foster the good traits in her or in other young people. That is just so valuable. I would encourage all of us to do that. I know I say it often here, but 
it really distills to how we see God, who we say God is and who man is and how God relates to man. That really informs us on all of these topics. If you're hearing all of this for the first time and you say, wow, I'm not a Christian. What in the world is this guy talking about? He's on a Disney cruise or something ideologically. I, I hope you'll write me John at John Warren media Dot com. I genuinely want to help. I think I gave you parenting soup today. I think that was the discussion. I know that some of the things I said probably um, would stretch all of us a bit. Some sound like parenting soup a little, but I hope this was helpful. It's been on my mind. I was thinking about titling this by several other titles, and one was What Our Children Wish We Knew About Parenting. I know that we're all flawed and I I know your family's flawed and you're probably thinking, well, I can't do that or it doesn't work that way or I've already made all these mistakes. Redemption is a wonderful thing. Redemption isn't just something that happens at salvation. When when we repent and turn to Christ and and rely on him and his finished work to save us, it's not just a one-time event. It is how we are to live. So regardless of the mistakes you've made, healing is possible. Pick up the phone, call a parent, call a child, call a a grandchild, call a grandparent, go visit, sit down, work through these challenges together. Relationship builds equity, which builds entitlement to some degree to engage on these topics. You probably would be hard pressed to call a person you haven't talked to in 20 years and start like it was 20 years ago and nothing happened. But I hope these principles, these thoughts are at least helpful. And I hope they'll start a conversation that will be productive because after all, the goal here is to glorify God with our lives. And we can't do that if we don't engage, engage with the world and engage with it. Well, so This has been Children's Lives Matter. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope it's helpful. I'd love to hear from you, John, at johnwarrenmedia.com or go to our contact form, uh, contact tab on our website, johnwarrenmedia.com. You've been listening to Relentless Truth. It is an honor to have you as part of this podcast. I am amazed at when I bump into you and hear from you at the the impact that we're having. I'm grateful for this opportunity and I look forward to being with you again next week. Thanks for listening to Relentless Truth with John Warren. Please consider sharing this podcast and subscribe to receive future episodes. Connect with John regarding your comments, questions, and show ideas through johnwarrenmedia.com or at John Warren Media on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. That's all for this episode. Join us next week for another edition of Relentless Truth with John Warren.